Hola, aloha, so much love, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. And Linda, are you still there? Yes, I'm here, Kay Pacha, and we can hear you really well. Oh, good. Uh, so are you interviewing me and asking me questions, or am I just supposed to start talking? No, it's all over to you. This is not an interview style um, meeting. It's all about you today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <coughs> all right, well. Okay. <clears throat> our topic is Aries Libra, <clears throat> uh, freedom in relationships. And where to go with that? I mean, my goodness gracious, uh, I'm taking it that many of you are uh, astrologers already and you're familiar with a lot of these archetypes, but I'm going to maybe just uh, repeat a few things that you already know. And I am definitely open to opening the chat box later on and, and working with questions. That's what I work best with. When I do chart readings, I always ask people, what, what do you want to know? <laughs> that's, that's a good place to focus. Um, but if you're on this webinar, you probably want to know how in the hell to maintain some sense of freedom within a relationship because it seems to evaporate quite easily. So we just want to really look at and, and understand uh, this polarity. And like the, like the description of the talk said, you know, the dual coexisting desires within the soul, yeah, for this, you know desire for freedom. So let's just look at Aries. And this is not just Aries. We all have Aries ruling some house in the chart. We all have a Mars somewhere. We all have planets in the first house or in the sign of Aries. This isn't just sun sign astrology, but this is the, the mystery school of Aries. That is the way that I look at Aries is the animal. <laughs> We are spiritual beings in animal bodies. And first house planets, Aries planets, Mars itself is spontaneous. It is impulsive. It is narcissistically oriented, self-oriented. I, me, my, I want, I am, I have, I conquer, I hunt, I control, I experience myself through cardinal fire. Yeah, and cardinal, I look at Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, cardinal fixed mutable. So cardinal energy is creative energy, it's expressive energy, it's yang, it's extroverted outgoing energy. This is why associated with hunting, okay, and with taking, with asserting, with leading, pioneering, charging. First house, first sign of the zodiac, follows Pisces. Infinite potential, out of infinite potential comes a desire. Mars, Aries, the lower octave of Pluto, the soul. As Jeffrey always said, we know we have a soul because we have desire. So this first house Aries energy is self-determined, independent, needs space and room. It wants control. It wants to be in charge. It is absolutely about freedom and I, me, my. And like I say, it is also highly unconscious. In fact, Aries energy, first house planets, it's like they, they get to know themselves through throwing something out there, spontaneously acting, smacking somebody or, you know, winning the race or whatever. It's like, it's what they put out. The feedback that they get from Libra, from the other, from other people, is how they evolve. It's how they see themselves. It's how they become conscious and how they grow. So we all have this element and this aspect within us. We all have a powerful animal, okay? We all have a sexual instinct, a desire to conquer, to hunt, to charge. It's the wild man. 
And Jeffrey even talks about the dual sexual nature of women. Yes, that the, that the sexual nature of a woman from the, from the primary brain is twofold. That the woman wants, number one, the strongest seed, which is the wild man. Yeah. And wants a safe, protective home builder. Yeah, which is the housekeeper man. So this dual nature even within women then obviously if you've got more aries energy whether you're masculine or feminine you have this very powerful masculine quality and masculine quality is also can be described as the sword the sword that cuts the cords from the past the machete that cuts its way into the future yeah and the scalpel that does surgery so this Aries energy is forward, progressive, futuristic, self-oriented, charge. And if it wasn't for, and this is where I say, all of the polarities need each other. Yeah? I, it's funny, because just yesterday uh, I was on a radio show with Kristen Fontana, another evolutionary astrologer talking about the air the the virgo pisces axis <laughs> today i'm talking about the aries libra axis aries needs libra libra needs aries and i swear if you get to the dead center point there's like a vacuum cleaner suction that just like you know liberates you <laughs> the shashumna <laughs> it's enlightenment yeah if you get to the very 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 center so I just described the one side of the teeter-totter. The other side of the teeter-totter is what? The polar opposite. Yeah. Seventh house, Libra, Venus is looking for partnership, relationship, communication. It's an air, cardinal air, Brahma air, initiating conversation, <laughs> initiating yeah, intellectual, objective. It's the scales that has to do with law, balance, peace, harmony, nonviolent communication. Now, this is all Libra. The ability to put the self in other people's shoes, to see the other side of the coin. Yeah, to, you know, to like really be there for other people, working with other people connecting with other people, listening. <laughs> so Mars is acting. Libra is active listening. <laughs> so, you know, these two balance each other. And when you get too far out in one polarity, Libra can go too far out to become codependent. Libra can get too far out to getting their own sense of identity that my own meaning to life through and with partnership okay and aries can just ignore partnership and take and be this you know self-centered you know monster that just you know actually you know has no respect or understanding or appreciation or even ability to <laughs> have any idea of what the other person is going through feeling or thinking or anything they're just like so totally self-absorbed <laughs> and libra on the other hand why do they have such a hard time making up their minds <laughs> it's because they don't know themselves they uh, you know especially pluto south node moon over there it's just like you know what i've been so busy being everything for everybody else I know what everybody else wants. And I've been role playing and partner playing and being this and being that and being the other thing. I am totally out of touch with myself. We've got a whole generation of people with Pluto in Libra. Yeah. You know, I was there through the seventies or something, you know, and eighties. Yeah. Their Pluto polarity point is Aries. It's like, you got to find themselves. And this is the other aspect of the head. It's an air sign. 
So it's thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and objective and what do you want and you want and I'm listening and listening and listening and listening and I'm just like out of touch with my Aries. I'm out of touch with my Mars. I'm out of touch with my first house. I've got to like find myself instead of pleasing everybody, serving everybody, caretaking everybody. I need my Aries. So these are the two polarities. But the really thing that I was thinking about, I was actually thinking about this uh, interview before talking. <laughs> you know, because fire and air are both masculine in astrology. And we're coming from this patriarchy. And fire and air is masculine, patriarchy. This is head stuff, right? You know, Aries rules the head. <laughs> Libras can't get out of their head. They can't stop thinking. You know, they're the lawyers among us. Okay, well, that's not fair. <laughs> oh, that's not just. Oh, yeah, I would think, well, what's the other guy going to say about that? You know, da -da -da, I'm the mediator. I'm always in the middle and blah, 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 working things out. Wow. Intellectually <laughs> and talking, 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 talking. Well, guess what, right? Aries Libra is square. Capricorn Cancer. Yeah? And this is the earth and the water, and this is the feminine, and this is where the rubber hits the road, okay? This is like where it really boils down to, okay? It comes down to whether this, these relationships are fulfilling, okay, you know, are secure, are solid. Uh, you know, it's like, and then that leads me into what? So much of our relationships is resolving our early childhood conditions, our early childhood wounds with none other than our parents. <laughs> our, and not only, if not our parents, our caregivers. I'm all into this Harville Hicks now, you know, with this uh, how to find the love you need or how to find the love you want or how to get the love you want, something like that. But he's talking about the Imago which is the collective image of all the caregivers that you've ever had in your childhood. And that is what makes up your partner and what you are unconsciously, subconsciously attracted to is the positive qualities of all that conglomeration of all your caregivers in your childhood. And so, you know, we know it's been said, you know, that, you know, women marry their fathers and men marry their mothers and this kind of a thing going on. And, you know, it, it, this, you know, there is this childhood patterning. It was our relationship of what love was, of what love is and how it is experienced has to do with our parents' relationships with each other and a parent, especially the parent of the opposite sex, our relationship. So this fourth house, 10th house axis is like super significant and super important in helping to bring, okay, these Aries, Libra, yeah, axis into balance. Because even if we look at the mythology, okay, Aries, you know, men or women have father issues. You can just look back to, you know, Jason and the Golden Fleece, okay, is this most uh, potent myth that has to do with Aries. And there's these bad kings and bad fathers in there. And in fact, he marries a sorceress. And so, the, you know, Aries has these, you know, challenging difficulties with relationships. And part of it is because why? They can be out of touch with their inner feminine nature. This is the shadow side of the feminine, is the sorceress. The shadow side is when we are unconscious of our soft, receptive, internal, emotional, spiritual, feminine side and nature. It becomes shadow, it becomes projected, and we know that Aries then, you know, is attracted to Okay, these, you know, super beautiful women and these super powerful women, but then they also, you know, have power struggles and want to conquer or be conquered. And there's the whole hunting and devouring and then hurt feelings and anger and all kinds of, you know, amazing stuff comes up with, you know, Aries kinds of relationships. And so much of this 
is that the Aries quality, okay, needs to become aware of what? Libra and the Venus, uh, you know, and aware of the feminine. Yeah. And that feminine is this water and this earth axis, yes, of this Cancer Capricorn. And of course, now we're all having a very, you know, powerfully uh, challenging time, you know, in our relationships and partnerships because Pluto is moving through Capricorn and it's squaring Libra. So everybody that was born with Pluto in Libra now, you know, is reaching their, you know, Pluto square Pluto. What is that around age 38 to 40? or something you're you know you're, everybody's getting it but it's also squaring this aries axis and then we've also had this jupiter uranus so i want to talk about some of these transits that are moving through aries and libra now so number one i would say we're coming out of the patriarchy we're coming out of a masculine dominated okay thousands of years of this you know hierarchical okay you know, control and assert and, you know, conquer and compete and the survival of the fittest, which has been the strongest and the richest and the smartest. And, you know, this is just like, you know, I, me, my first kind of energy has been going on on this planet for thousands of years. Breaking that down, breaking that apart, metamorphosing that and changing that into something of a higher frequency or a higher vibration doesn't happen overnight. You know, it takes a long time. So, you know, I give it, you know, at least 500 years to change in age. But we're going to say that Uranus moving through Aries from March of 2011 until next May. Uranus has been bringing in enlightenment shock, awe, brand new, okay, desires, a new take on the masculine. It's like the masculine waking up. It's like the whole planet is now seeing, okay, you know, firsthand, you know, it's like our eyes are wide open now to the masculine quality, both in its most positive sense, that strong, powerful action that accomplishes and gets things done, and it's dark negative manifestation, okay, of, you know, self-centered individualism to the point of greed and gluttony and just taking without asking, yeah, and, uh, you know, over pushing people's boundaries and not respecting the other. So this Uranus quality moving through Aries has been kind of in a way yeah, activating each and every single one of us and our first house and our Mars energy and wherever we have Aries in our chart, okay, to like really open up that third eye, open up our uh, awakening and use our masculine energy in a new enlightened way. So it has been liberating, yeah, so many people and individualizing. Uranus is the planet of individuation. I am unique. I am different. We even have this transgender uh, uh, movement happening. So this whole sexual revolution is, you know, just like really coming full bore. It's like full on right now. Okay, and so many people are going through so many changes in regard to their sexual identity. And this is only going to increase, yes, as Uranus goes into Taurus. Yeah, for the next seven years, starting next May. Okay, Mars and Venus, Aries and Taurus, we have this whole sexual identity what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. So we have men getting in touch with their feminine side. We have women getting in touch with their masculine side. So we have this whole, you know, this, this process of liberation, I think, happening on so many levels. But like I talk about so many times, you know, with the, with the evolutionary stages, this whole masculine feminine energy, okay, can get to the point where what? Yeah. You know, the men are becoming feminine, 
which is what? They can be in the moment, soft, changeable, unreliable, reflecting the immediate moment. Yeah, like Mother Nature changes and the moon changes and the feminine naturally changes. And so, you know, the feminine, you know, as, as, you know, men move into the new age or, you know, they start doing, you know, emotional workshops and self-discovery and, you know, they say, you know, their meditation and their guitar and everything becomes more important and more important and their inner, inner, inner feminine world becomes more important. They become unreliable, undependable, untrustable. And, you know, so many of the women, you know, are just like, you know, turned off by the flaky, emotional, uh, unpredictable, uh, new age, uh, you know, guys out there. On the other hand, we also have the, 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 the women finding their Aries and finding their Mars and finding their masculine. And of course, they turned into Angelina Jolie's where they chop their breasts off and they're, you know, self-determined and make their own decisions and they are hardcore and they are tough and they are independent and nobody's going to push them around and, you know, and so, you know, you know then they can also, you know, uh, you know, be in this place where, you know, they find the soft guy. So the soft guy finds the hard woman instead of the, you know, soft woman finding the hard man. <laughs> 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 it's a fucking trip, man. Right? I mean, you see it happening all over the place, right? You know, I mean, it's a, it's this it's this whole kind of, you know, uh, thing, you know, going on that that we're having now. And of course, there's this, you know, this is beautiful. You know, I mean, it's 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 you know, uh, it's it's time, okay, for that you know individuation process. And that is what twenty percent of any given population is in that individuated stage. And then I look at it, you know, as what, you know, after you, you, you get into your models and your roles of Mars and Venus. Okay. And then, you know, you find the other, right. You know, then there's the, like the Cadesius, you know, or the Shishumna, it comes back. Yeah. And the Mars comes back to being Mars, only it's not the lower octave or vibration of Mars anymore. It's in that spiritual stage. And the, and the Venus, you know, you know, finds that, you know, Martian quality, but returns to the feminine, but it's not at that same lower octave of Venus either. Right. And so then you have what the higher octave of Mars is Pluto. The higher octave of Venus is Neptune. <laughs> so then you've got Pluto Neptune relationships. <laughs> Wow, I just thought of that. That's brand new. So, yeah, but look at that. You know, so in the spiritual stage, you have intense Pluto. <laughs> you know, super spiritual, psychic. You know, absolutely. You know, totally, beautifully connected kinds of energy uh, and exchange going on. And and in this, you know, in in these uh, spiritual stage, there is. How can we? You know, how can we say it? It's like. I mean, I like David Data's thing, right? I think I've said it before a thousand times. You've probably heard it, but, you know, it's like the masculine is the painter and the feminine is the paintbrush, the canvas, the paint, the water, the easel, the inspiration for the painting. So the feminine is everything. <laughs> it's the now. It's the moment. It's the substance. It's the inspiration. And the masculine is the purpose, the action, the doer, the solid determinants. Is like, you know, she has to find that purpose within itself. It's, I, and I also see it like the pole, you know, the pier. And, you know, uh, when you're at the boat dock, the boat dock, you know, you got the pier. It's like the pole holding the pier. And the feminine water splashes and, you know, depends on or, you know, that that pole is solid. It's very present. It's very listening. It holds space for the feminine to move and change and flow and move. And the, the thing about the feminine, and I particularly like that painter, is because what? And this is where the, the challenge, I think, for Libra, you know, the challenge for, you know, to balance this axis of, you know, uh, you know self and other. Mars and Venus, Aries and Libra, first house, seventh house, particularly of the feminine nature, this Venus has to allow what? The paintbrush to poke her. 
Yeah. Well, what does that paintbrush do? It dibs into the paint. I want some blue. Smush, smash, smish. Gah. And then I take that blue and I smear it over here. And then I take some yellow, you know, and it's just like, whoa, the role of the feminine, the path of the feminine, okay, is to, it's like to let the, the, the bull in the china shop. You know, I mean, here's the beautiful goddess energy feminine. And it's like, I, you know, it's got to, I got to let this bull in. It's going to break all my China, man. I got it all beautiful and everything sweet and lovely and nice. And here comes this raw, <laughs> you know, unconscious animal, <laughs> you know, nature, you know, into my beautiful Libra, you know, uh, finished school, China shop, everything's perfect. <laughs> it's like. Bash! It's like, oh Jesus! <laughs> oh my God! You know, it's so nice. I'm in a masculine body this lifetime. Uh, I, it is. Uh, I do have the nodes in the fourth and the tenth house, though. So I think I, I'm coming from previous lives in the female body, so I can kind of relate. <laughs> but let's look at the, you know, the, the other the other side of the masculine. Okay, you know, the other side of the masculine. You know, in, 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 this, in, in this other state of this other place, right, you know, is to like really be there in a place of honor, respect. It's like opening. It's like taking that blue and spreading it out. It's like the blue gets to see itself and expand itself and blossom and be seen in even greater, deeper, wider, broader ways. So it's just like, you know, it, there's this, there is in a way, I like to say interdependent or intradependent with this masculine and feminine. It's like the masculine realizes its own power, okay, through the painting, through the, you know, through the result of the mingling of the action of the honoring of the feminine or the opening of the feminine or revealing the feminine unto herself. Okay. It's just like, you know, it's just like, you know, the, the feminine is just like so internal earth and water is so like heavy and in, you know, introverted and down. It's like, so it's like bringing these uh, seashells from the depths of the ocean up to the surface. You know, the masculine is like the, the sea diver, you know, that goes down and, you know, brings up, you know, the, you know, the shells and whatever, you know. So it's just like, so, and in so doing, okay, fulfills its purpose. The masculine fulfills its purpose that, that you could say that the, you know, the, the, the primary function of the masculine, okay, is to open, reveal, fertilize, uh, assist the whole blossoming. It's like the sun, you know, the sun, you know, you know with the, the, one of the main purposes of sunlight, you know, is to have everything on earth grow. <laughs> and photosynthesis <laughs> and you know so it's like you know it's like the role of the masculine okay is to you know is is to just like assist the process of the feminine expressing exposing revealing you know layer upon layer upon layer of a uh, petal upon petal upon petal of her flower you know to open so it's like men who are not in that they are not seeing that doing that you know fulfilling that function are missing something are not feeling okay as they're not like living their mission or they're not really fully doing their purpose or they're not and they can therefore not feel inwardly fulfilled so this you know this is a this is a very you know uh, um you know, powerful state of being with Uranus moving through Aries, this individuation, okay? It's like, okay, yes, we all need to go off, but I always see relationship as the fire. And if you all just sit in this seventh house Libra relationship and warm yourselves and warm yourselves and warm yourselves, the fire goes out. So then you got to do Aries. You got to go out into the woods, into the dark, on your own, by yourself, 
and find some fuel, find some wood, develop yourself, your inner strength, your inner self, knowing your inner self knowledge and bring that back. And then that feeds the relationship. Yeah. So this is this balance of, you know, of this freedom and being in relationship is that if you're too much in the relationship pole, the fire goes out and yeah, you need the new Aries is all about the new. Yeah. So you've got to do this Aries energy where you break out and you break free. So ideally, you know, the way that relationships can become most successful is when each person involved in that relationship encourages, you know, the other to self-develop, to spend some time alone, to take time out you know, to go into their own processes or follow their own passion or, you know, yeah. It's like when you get into this, you know, place of, you know, jealousy or possessiveness or, you know, uh, insecurity uh, where, you know, you're holding and gripping. It's like the, the more you hold and the more you grip, guess what? The more you are ensuring <laughs> that, you know, it's going to go. And of course, you know, that is what Scorpio is all about. Yeah. Yeah. That follows Libra is, you know, ending, finishing and transforming that. So these are some thoughts that, you know, just, you know, kind of uh, come up for me. And I don't know if that triggers anything for anybody. Um, I see 15 notes in the chat box. I don't know, Linda, is there something that, you know, uh, more that we wanted to, you know, uh, talk about. Well, I didn't talk about Jupiter and Libra, but. Uh huh. Okay. Um, if you could talk about Jupiter and Libra, I've asked people to um, type their questions into the chat or they can actually unmute themselves and ask a question. So, would you like a few questions now, K. Pacha? Or wait? I'll, I'll spend about two minutes on Jupiter and Libra because uh -huh. it's pretty simple. Okay, beautiful. And if everyone can have a question ready, or if you if you would like to ask a question, uh, that'll be coming up in a few minutes. Go ahead. Go so, uh, Jupiter and Libra. Okay, you know, really, uh, uh, from September, right, September tenth or something of uh, two thousand and sixteen, until next month, October. Jupiter in the sign of Libra. Cardinal initiate partnership and relationship. It's like, you know what, you know, come hell or high water, you know, I, I've been encouraging people that this is the year to expand, prosper, evolve, develop, just grab a fucking partner, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know Libra can be very fussy. <laughs> Libras can be more fussy than Virgos, you know. I mean, it's just like, whoa, baby, you know. Anyway, but, you know, that, that this Jupiter moving through Libra, is that guess what you know we are now in the process of expanding our understanding of what it is what is partnership what is relationship what is balance and peace and like i say there's thousands of different kinds of relationship right mother daughter teacher counselor you know a uh, boss employee there's thousands of different kinds of relationships you know pet owner and pet but Libra has to do, okay, with partnership. And partnership, okay, is equal sharing, equal give and take, equal amounts of decision making, equal amounts of communicating. So it's like Jupiter is the great teacher. And it's this year has been this time of relationships really teaching us about what we, you know, what we need, who we are, how much we can put up with, what triggers our anger, what, you know, it's like how much we can give versus how much we need to like, you know, maintain, you know, our own space or our own free dynamic happening, our own independence. But it's, it's like finding ourselves and seeing ourselves through 
relationship. We're coming out of the age of Pisces. Pisces, for the last 2,000 years, if you want to find yourself, go meditate, go to the top of the mountain, go to the cave, go to the ashram, go to the monastery, go to the convent. That's not the future. The future is the age of Aquarius. The future is community. The future is social. Okay, it's just like, you know what? We're going to be finding ourselves. The only way you're going to see your shadow, and I was even thinking about this, you know, like the teachers and gurus, you know, most of them are fucking single, you know? And it's like, sure, it's a cakewalk, okay? Life is a single person is a cakewalk. You've got nobody showing you your shadow, nobody triggering you, <laughs> nobody, you know, humbling you, nobody pointing out those itsy bitsy little secrets that only the most intimate person can ever see. It's easy to walk around like you know fucking everything when you're single. <laughs> And this is Aries, right? This is the Aries first house. This is Uranus and Aries. The last seven years, it's been everybody's like breaking up and being single. So it's like, yeah, like, you know, I got to get into a place of like where I know myself or see myself or come to a place of accepting or loving myself. And, you know, and, and, you know, the partners are always tearing me down, ripping new holes in my sail. So I can't go anywhere. You know, I mean, relationships can be super freaking debilitating. They, you know, you, you know, they check your self-confidence. You know, they humble you. You know, there's nothing like a deep, intimate, you know, relationship to, you know, bring you down into the underworld. And this is where Jupiter is going as of October for the next year. So let's all get ready for a good deep sea dive <laughs> it's gonna get really intense on the relationship <laughs> level okay so Wanda go ahead with your question um, I wanted to know your views on um, since the the zodiac since everything's connected Aries is coming out of Pisces so if a person has a preponderance of Aries energy, um, that might mean that they are having to break away from the, ent the entrapment, the engulfment of the prior Pisces um, energy. And since you brought up a Jupiter and Libra, um, Jupiter to me is about honesty. So it feels like to me that this is about um, bringing out the, the truth and honesty of the relationship paradigm, which for the most part has been pretty codependent. So I'd like to know your, your views on that. Well, first of all, the, the main thing you know, is number one, you need to look at the whole chart. So number two, uh, which I, I want to address to you is just that it super depends on what planets you're talking about. <laughs> you know, I, you know, having, you know, Pluto in the first house or having the moon in Aries is very different than having Saturn in Aries or what, you know, you know, so are you talking like, you know, sun, Mercury, Venus kind of a thing? Or? Um, well, using myself as an example, I actually do have um, Pluto in the first house. It's conjunct Uranus, but I also have the moon in the 12th. Uh, Pluto is the ruler of my south node, and I have several planets in Pisces. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, you know, the, the, the way I see it is you're coming from the 12th house, you're learning the ascendant, you're moving in even to the first house and then into the second house as, as kind of an evolutionary flow. So, the moon is also associated with the past. So, for yourself, particularly if that Uranus Pluto is on the ascendant, you're learning how to do Uranus Pluto. Okay. So the moon in, uh, you know, the moon in Pisces over there is going to say, yes, my past has been, I see Pisces as selfless giving angels. 
There's no ego in Pisces. You know, it's a doormat. It's like, I'm here for you. I'm an angel. What can I do for you? I'm a genie in a bottle. <laughs> so like, you know, your past and even your inner world, the 12th house is also your inner world, okay? It's like, you're a super sweetie pie. <laughs> and it, it's just like, you're all there. And particularly if you're Aries rising, you know, this Uranus Pluto in the, in the first house, you know, this lifetime, okay, is about, you know, okay, this discovery of self, okay, and that discovery of self, you know, can be particularly, you know, Uranus was conjunct Pluto in Virgo, okay, so, you know, I mean, you can, you know, I don't know exactly what's going on with you, but, you know, we've got, you know, this whole kind of a condition in a situation where I would say you're uh, in this lifetime recovering yeah, from many past lifetimes of people exploiting you, using you, you being the servant, okay, and, you know, uh, people being very critical of you, and you've just, like, really been in, in uh, you know, a, a victim place, you know, for super many lifetimes. This lifetime, okay, your evolution is through the Pluto polarity point. I'm sorry. I have Pluto in the first house myself, and we're both moving from the first house of thank you very much i'll be myself or do it myself and just like you know i'm tired of being dominated or ruled or or butter how the future evolution is the seventh house yeah it's like it's like you have to find yourself in order to give yourself away yeah it's like you know it's, it's you can't give what you ain't got so your life, I think, is a, this huge, long process of, yes, you need to discover, 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 you know, become stronger and more independent and more powerful. And then guess what you get to do? <laughs> you get to pass it on and give it away and show, you know, show other people how great they are and put them on the stage. And, you know, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's a trip that way. So now, you know, you know in, in terms of Jupiter moving through Libra, I don't know, it depends on really more what house that is for you, you know, but I hope I answered some, you know, something for you. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Pacha, we have a question from Megan. Um, how are Librans fussier than Virgos? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, 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 Libra comes out of Virgo. Right. If you, you know, if you do this whole evolutionary wheel. Okay. And so, uh, you know, Virgo has the mental, you know, the, the, the mental concept of perfection and, and what can be and, you know, works on it and works on it and works on it. And then it moves into it's, it's, that's, you know, uh, Virgo is Mercury. Venus is Libra. Okay. I want to see it. It's got to be beautiful. So Libra, you know, is very much about comparing. Okay, you know, comparing who I'm with with you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, everybody else out there, and it's it's just like you know, in so many ways, Virgo is the twelfth house of Libra. Yeah, if you put Libra in the first house, Virgo is the twelfth house, and the twelfth house is my inner inner world. So, you know, Libra has this inner, inner 12th house of Virgo that inwardly they, are, they have this whole ideal and understanding of perfection. And this lifetime, you know, this, this, this energy of Libra is really, you know, looking, air is visual. It's the surface of things. The wind blows over the surface of things, right? So Libra wants to see and also hear the harmony, the sound, the music, the, you know, the, so it's all about beauty, 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 beauty for Libra. That's how they can be more. Okay. Perfection. Brooke, go ahead, Brooke. Hi, Brooke. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. I can oh, hear you. Great. What's going on? <laughs> I'd like to. I don't, I don't know if putting the video on really uh, means anything, but hey, it's uh, thank you for doing this, and I, I really appreciate it. I'm a big fan of yours. Um, so I was wondering, uh, I know all this stuff is really super extensive, but I was wondering what it may mean uh, just on a personal level that I have a 
my sun in Aries and my moon in Libra. So I'm a full moon baby. And my Aries is in the eighth house. So what would that make the Libra? What is the opposite of the eighth house? <laughs> sun, you have the sun in Aries in the eighth house. So you got uh, the moon in Libra in the second house. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Or, or is it the third? I think it's the third house. Maybe. Uh huh. Uh -huh. um, so I was just wondering, even if briefly, I know there's like a ton of stuff that I could. Um... Well, I, I, I think I can just talk a little bit about the opposition aspect, <laughs> the full moon aspect. Okay. And this is just like where, and this is, you know, the, the sun opposite the moon. You're just like dealing so much with, Okay. This is like the moon moving through that 180 degree aspect is going to create, you know, situations where it's time. Okay. That's mm -hmm. a very nice uh, cabinet you've got there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I found, found my chart. It's uh, Aries in the ninth house, Libra in the uh, pink. <laughs> I know that might be really hard to yes, see. Yes, I see that. No, I got it. Yeah, I got yeah. it. So, um, you know, t t to me, what I see with that aspect is basically, and this is with the opposition and anybody with, you know, particularly Venus, Mars, and Sun and Moon, you know, in opposition aspect, this is the point, the point where you're coming out and you've been in this self oriented, self determined, I have found my purpose. I have found myself. And now it's time to come out and get this party started. And so there is this, you know, there's this like, okay, I got to open the door and step outside myself. And it's scary. It's kind of scary because I don't want to lose myself. I just spent lifetimes or this whole thing getting a hold of, okay, this is who I am and this is what I want and this is where I'm going. You know, and, and then I'm going to like, you know, relationship challenges all of that. It's, you know, and so it's like uh, to hold on to, you know, myself and be in relationship, okay, at the same time is the trick, okay? So this sun moon opposition says that, you know, this lifetime for you is about, you know, learning so much about, right, partnership and relationship and understanding these dynamics and without losing yourself. The other, the other thing is what? Coming out and on too strong. So, it's also coming into, yeah, I'm going to do relationship and partnership and I'm going to be in control and I'm going to be in charge and I'm going to be on top and there's, there's no way I'm losing my purpose or my identity. I'm going to build relationships around me, you know, and around I. So there's like, you can, you can go overboard either way. You can be scared and insecure and not come out fully into the relationship because you're afraid of losing yourself. Or you can err on the side of like too much where like you come out like a, you know, a, a bull or a racehorse or something, you know, and it's not really a relationship. It's more, you know, you're just kind of dominating the show. Yeah. So, for, you know, for you, this opposition and this Aries Libra kind of a thing is that, yes, you want to do relationship, but you want to try to do it in that balanced way where you're not too small and you're not overwhelming. Yeah, I hear that. <laughs> for you in particular, it's just like you're so smart, okay? This is all happening on your third and your ninth house axis, you know? You gotta, you know, you gotta like give your partner, you know, some time to, you know, talk and have their own ideas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I know, I'm a little quickly, but um, yeah. Hey, thank you. I, uh, I really, <laughs> really appreciate the advice. All right, baby. <laughs> nice to see you. Okay, Linda, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Linda. Hi. 
Thanks, Kaipatcha. You're a star. Um, I met you in Cairo two years ago. Anyway, um, my question is that um, I've got South Node Libra and North Node Aries. So I'm wondering if how that might, you know, how can I step into that Aries effectively? Get in touch with your anger. Mm, my, uh, you know, you... You know, you, you may have spent a few lifetimes, okay, uh, avoiding confrontation, mm. uh, seeking out peace, harmony, and balance, and being very nice and smiling a lot and being very diplomatic and being very tactful. And, you know, this North Node in Aries, you know, is about, yes, my gut, okay? You know, it's and, and, and when we don't confront and when we don't like really say and have those hard conversations, okay, and just like really get down past the nice, you know, the nice diplomatic uh, phrasing and nonviolent communication and get down into the nitty gritty feelings, you know, and the negative emotions and just like really come up with all that stuff. When we don't have those intense, deep conversations of an emotional nature, which it's very challenging for Aquarius to have. <laughs> you said, I think you said, yeah, you got the sun in Aquarius. Okay. This is calling you like this lifetime is really calling you into your animal instinct, into, you know, your primal expression, into yourself. And this is the thing that I always say, you know, we don't know ourselves. We, we, we think, okay, you know, it's like we think we know who we are, and that's exactly what it is. It's a bunch of thoughts. Actions speak louder than words, okay? And we have images and ideals of who we are, but when it gets down into the bedroom, when it gets down into intimacy, when it gets down into asserting yourself in the face of a powerful other, this is where you really get to see and know what you're made of. It's our emotions that is really who we are. Our thoughts is who we think we are. So you are very intellectual, you are very intelligent, you can be very objective, and you can see other people's stuff left and right and in and out and up and down, and you're a great manager and a great therapist and all this and that and the other. But when it really comes to satisfying yourself, that's what you're learning. This lifetime is learning about fulfilling your fucking self. <laughs> you, know, you know, enough about everybody else, man. <laughs> You know, so you're it's saying a, that I need to um, like embrace the conflict rather than um, I'm Mars and Aquarius. I'm a Sagittarian, so you're saying that rather than walk away and and be graceful, I've got to actually have conflict. Yeah, and you need to, in some way, shape, and form, come a little bit out of you know your head and into your body. So exercise, stimulation, you know, it's like Aquarius, I always say, you know, they got to get pulled off the ceiling, you know, and brought into their bodies because they're just like, you know, you know, in the galactic intelligence, you know, realm, you know, in the Sagittarius is this whole expansion of consciousness. All you're telling me is you've got tons of fire and air and fire and air is just a hot air balloon. So you're just like up, up, up. And your North Node in Aries is saying, you know what, honey? You want to get down. <laughs> Good okay. luck with that I'd one. I'd like to do the dancing, the uh, stars uh, in India with you. I just When I saw it, I thought, oh, my God, that's just amazing. That's going to be a good way to get yeah. down. Absolutely. Yeah, Thank you so much. You Bye. betcha. Okay. Thanks, Linda. Go ahead, Way. Hi, Katatra. Um, I have a question just uh, generally. What's your thoughts about Mars in Libra or even Mars in Seventh House, you know, and what's uh, your suggestion for those people have that? Well, I, you know, it's a little similar to what I was just talking about with our, uh, with our last person here because, you know, uh, as uh, evolutionary astrology says, we evolve through the polarity point of Mars. So 
you know, Mars in Libra, Mars in the seventh house. I, you know what? I actually have a feeling that planets in the seventh house is planets that we are unconscious of that psycho spiritual function or that element, or that aspect of ourselves. So much so that we need other people to play it out for us. <laughs> So it's just like Mars in the seventh house, okay? And then to some degree, Mars in Libra is like, you know what? I'm, I'm never angry. I never, I'm never violent. I'm never selfish. You know, I'm always, you know, thinking about the other and, you know, being the mediator and I'm a good person and I'm this, that, and the other thing. And, you know? You know, my boyfriend or my spouse or, you know, you know I, I'm actually attracted to race car drivers, <laughs> you know, motor, motorcycle men. Or it's like, you know, I, you know, I end up, okay, with Mars coming at me from, from somebody else or in my relationships and partnerships. You know, I'm experiencing my Mars out there. So... I, you know, the thing here that I encourage, okay, and the evolution of Mars in the seventh house or Mars in Libra is going to be to balance it out by coming more into the first house, by coming more into Aries. And that is in one way, shape, and form, I'd say you don't know how to be selfish. So practice, <laughs> try, <laughs> check it out, <laughs> put yourself first once in a while, okay? Like, you know, it, it practice speaking what you want. And you'll find maybe that you don't know what you want until you speak it or until you do it. You can spend a lot of time, uh, you know, is, is this okay with everybody? And, you know, is everybody going to like it if I do this or that or the other thing? And it's just like, you know what? Get more impulsive. Become more spontaneous. And if you have a flash an insight, an, an instinctive desire to jump, jump. Tr begin to trust your animal. Begin to trust your instinctive nature, that your sense of smell and your, you know, your animal knows what you want and knows what's going to fulfill you and knows what's going to bring you joy and power and a sense of, yeah, juiciness and fire. So the more you practice being spontaneous and trusting your instinct and, you know, just like, you know, oh my God, my mother would never want me to say fuck, but you know, I'm going to say fuck. <laughs> I mean, you know, Mars and Libra doesn't, you know, doesn't say fuck. <laughs> well, thank you so much. That's really smart, wise. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. So Bernadette, please go ahead. Hi, Kapati. Hi, Bernadette. How's it going? Hi, so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I want to ask about if you can s tell about uh, Chiron in Aries, because <coughs> I have that in the second house, and uh, it's my Pluto polarity point. I have Pluto in. Well, uh, how exciting for you, my dear. Yes, you got. Uh, yes. Pluto over I, there in Virgo with uh, uh, Chiron over there. Yeah. yeah, I have Pluto in the 8th house in Libra. In Libra, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's well, my polarity point, Aries in Chiron. All I can say is your wound, I don't have to do anything, prove anything, say anything, accomplish anything, screw you guys, I just freaking am. I'm freaking yes. Aries, man. You know, so, so <laughs> yes. what we can say is, especially with Pluto over there in Libra in the eighth house, in your past lifetimes, okay, yeah. there were people who gave you the message that you don't deserve to exist unless you please them and be yeah. what they want. And you have been manipulated and exploited and tried to, you know, be this and that. And you've made yourself smaller and shrinking. And, and so you can get to this point where, you know, what I want doesn't matter. What, you know, it's like, you know, yeah. nobody ever, you know, gives me shit, you know, I'm always, and you can go into that wound, okay, you know, of I must not be worth 
you know, anything. Nobody's giving me anything or treating me like I'm valuable or blah, 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 blah. So, and this is my, uh, you know, the key words that I use for Chiron is investigate and research. Chiron became yeah. the founder of homeopathy because he tried to find the cure to his wound. And so wherever that is, is you have to investigate Aries. You have to investigate your sexuality. You have to investigate your anger. You have to investigate your willpower. You just have to like go, you have to like, you know, jump in a race car and step on the gas, even though it scares the shit out of you, just to see what it's like to go fast. Because you haven't yeah. gone fast. And you've always no. waited for permission. So you should practice yeah. like doing yeah. things without asking permission. <laughs> you know, and all this kind of thing to just like understand, okay, you know, what it's like to demand, okay, I want you to sexually please me. You know, it's just like you know, I'm tired of like, you know, always giving first. Okay, it's time for me to get. And yeah. then that becomes your medicine. You see, you begin to understand the, the force of desire, the force of will, okay, the force of animal instinct. And this is then what you turn other people on to. It's like, you know what, people? You know who you are and what you want. You don't need to ask and wait and, uh, you know, look for... Uh, you know, uh, you know, nobody can tell you who you are. It's like, you know, you've got to just like go for it. You're, this is, this becomes, you become a coach, you know, like, you know, really encouraging people to get out there and play the fucking game and fall down and look stupid and get dirty, pick yourself up again, be Aries. And, you know, and you're going to, you know, you're going to discover like I did how freaking phenomenal I am. Yes. Super. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Love you. Love you too. Great. Thank you. So here's a question from Victor. Um, Victor says, I am extremely new to astrology and don't understand most of this. All I know is that I'm an airy sun. Um, how would you suggest one moves out of solitude? Over the past five years, I have suffered trauma, not just from romantic relationships, but all kinds of love relationships and have stayed away completely from these aspects of life. So his question to you, Kay Pacha, is how would you suggest he moves out of solitude? Sorry, man. <laughs> you got to look at the whole chart. I, I don't do sun sign astrology. You know, to just find out that your son is in Aries does not give me enough information to really help or give any kind of advice at all. I mean, even knowing how old you are, I could understand where, you know, Pluto, Neptune, and Uranus are, uh, you know, or, or something like that. But I, you got to have more. Yeah, you're right. If you're brand new to astrology, I'll tell you what, astrology is like as complex as life. Okay, so it's it 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 it's it's really it's a it's a deep, profound study, and it reveals amazing results. <laughs> and I'm glad that you're here, and I want to encourage you. Uh, you know, when I but the only thing that I am going to say that the sun is where you shine. The sun is where you shine, and the sun in Aries shines. When you are pioneering, inventing, innovating, starting, beginning, charging, you want to get rid of the rearview mirrors and step on the fucking gas. Yeah. You want to focus on what's ahead of you and what you can be doing and where you're going. And guess what? Relationships, okay, will come to you when you are the leader, then you're going to find the sheep just flocking around you when you are the shepherd, okay? You're going to find that when you do your own freaking thing and you shine like a brilliant star, everybody is going to want you. When you're in a place of insecurity and fear, 
which you know, uh, uh, Mars has a moon phobia. <laughs> so, you know, Mars and Aries doesn't go anywhere without fear. And so it can also take a few years. I don't know how old you are, but you know, obviously this gets better the older you get. Okay. But you can start out with this insecurity and then it's like you're reaching for relationship and you're, you know, you're trying to be what somebody else wants or you're, you know, you're, you know, so it's just like, all I can say the best way for Aries to do relationship. Okay. Is to just like really focus on their soul purpose, you know, on your, you know, on, on, on what lights your fire on what makes you excited. You do that and let relationship happen. Don't go, don't, don't, don't go chasing a relationship, man. It's, it's not worth it. Great. Thanks, Kepacha. And thanks, Victor. And our last question now is from Lauren. Please go ahead. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Kepacha. I have a question because I have a loaded seventh house. I have Venus, um, the North Node, Pluto, and Uranus. And then I have Chiron and Aries, I mean, Chiron, Chiron and Aquarius in the south node in Aries in the first house. So my question is, is if you could speak on that, if I don't see myself in some areas, and am I going to get wounded in relationships? Mm -hmm. Like continually, you know? So that's kind of um, my question. You got anything square the nodes? Yes, I do. <laughs> I have Saturn square the nose, and it's an exact. It's um, Cardinals T square. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. And okay. I also have Chiron square Mercury and Pallas in the ninth house, and Jupiter's there. Uh, so you've got uh, uh, Saturn in Capricorn, or yes, and I'm coming up to my se uh, my second Saturn return. Uh huh. Okay. So you know, I mean, to me, I don't know how familiar you are, you know, with you know evolutionary astrology and everything but you know this the planets square the moon's nodes are like so super freaking important yes. and to me saturn is where i have said no i will not be capricorn i will not be the boss okay i will not take charge i will not take responsibility you know what i'm gonna let you drive so that if you, the, if we crash it's your fault <laughs> this is Pluto in the seventh house. Okay. This is like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to get with powerful partners. I'm going to get with powerful other people so that I don't have to do my Saturn and Capricorn. Okay. And then if everything fucks up, I come out smelling like a rose, baby. I can't make a mistake. Yeah. So that may have, they may have worked for a couple of lifetimes, but guess what? You know, it's not very empowering now, is it? So you got this Chiron in Aries. It's like, yeah, I can, I can be in powerful oh, relationships. Oh, Chiron and Aquarius. Yes, oh, conjunct okay. my ascendant. Yeah, so like it's oh. like I, I, do, I do drive and do all these things. I take responsibility a lot. However, it's like I, um, I'm, I, I don't like to talk or speak about ownership that often. It's like hard for me because Chiron squares Mercury. So it's mm -hmm. like really, really, really hard for me to take authority even though i might be very skilled i it's like i'm very hard for me to speak my voice so it's like i know i'm supposed to come out and do these things but there's a paralyzing fear all the time mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. what's your rising aries aquarius so oh, it jumps my yeah yeah i mean to, i mean to me you know pluto can is this pluto conjunct the north node yeah, but it's a really big conjunct. But I have the North Node, Pluto. The North Node's in Venus. Wait, the North Node is in... The main thing that I would say is just, yeah. you know, okay, you know, when Pluto and the North Node are in the same sign or the same house, it's just saying that, you know what, I've been doing this in my previous lifetimes, and I want to do it again, uh, but I want to do it differently. Okay, so you know, you know, all I'm really going to say is that the way that you're coming in here, I would, you know, and I say also that Aquarius rising is you're in the school of Aquarius, <laughs> and the school of Aquarius is this is a lifetime where I'm learning how to be eccentric, bizarre, unusual, raise people's eyebrows, drop people's jaws, you know, blow people's minds because in my previous lifetimes. 
I was nice Venus, Pluto in Libra in the seventh house, you know, the sweet little, you know, whatever model that everybody else wanted me to be and da, 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 da. And I didn't, you know, do my Saturn, which was just have boundaries, you know, and stay in my truth and my integrity and my unique expression. And so this lifetime, the tricky part is that the North Node is in Libra and it's in the seventh house. Yes, so it's yeah. not about going off to the mountaintop, okay, or being some discoverer uh, where I'm, you know, going to do archaeology and, you know, uh, spend my, uh, you know, uh, be a hermit in the desert or something. No, this is that you have to be weird, kinky, unusual, and unconventional with somebody. <laughs> so this means that you really want to do and find and live you know this amazing relationship that is new paradigm relationship that's liberated relationship that's where we're connected but we're free and yeah. we're individual but we're you know intimate and I, so it, it's like you want to have your cake and eat it too this lifetime and 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 the way to get there Okay, is to assert yourself is, you know, is to like really, you know, uh, you know, be in this in this place of experimenting with the unknown and the unconventional and be very inventive. Step out of your safety zone. Well, I've done that and got really hurt. So I'm like, you know, like, you know, loaded eighth house in Scorpio. So I'm like hiding and I, I know I got to like just chill out now and just do my Saturn, you know, just do my career, whatever. You got to have boundaries. Yes, learn you all. Gotta, you know, it's like right off the bat, you know, if you got a loaded eight house, you're psychic and you're intuitive and you know goddamn well right off the start, okay, that so-and-so is going to be, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and part of that Saturn is just like, you know what, that's not okay. And, you know, and I am like super clear on what I like, what I don't like, what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do and, you know, uh, how close you're coming and, you know, it's like, you got to be Saturn. Oh. Okay. Thank you so much, Kay Potcher, and thanks, Lauren. Okay. Thank we, you. we really must end this fantastic meeting. Kay Potcher, thank you so much. And I uh, hope we can see you again here at EA Zoom meetings. I'm just going to unmute okay. everybody now and we can all say thank you. Thank you, baby. Bye. Bye, baby. Bye, bye.